Hello and welcome to our first proper sunny weather of uh, 2021. It's been an absolute cracking day today. So I'm going to have a little wander around the garden. Oh, oh, a bit of cheese stuck in me teeth. Have a little, <laughs> little wander around the garden and we're going to talk about playing rock guitar in the uh, 80s. So... This is my garden. I don't know if I'm just going to walk in front of this um, beautiful rhododendron. It's about the only thing that's dared to flower because it's such a crap May. So, carry on through the garden and talk about this rock guitar in the 80s. So, so yes, I joined my first serious band in 1980 and uh, I think it's safe to say we were all teenagers and we were green, really green. And it was an interesting experience and I certainly learnt a lot from it. So when I look back to that, I can see uh, four, there was four of us to start with, naive teenagers, wanted to make it big and it was the new wave of British heavy metal at that time. Um, that was an incredible sort of period for rock music. Um, it was like a second coming of rock bands. And uh, I think there was a lot of us really thinking, you know, there's a lot of bands getting signed, put it that way. So there was us thinking, yeah, if they can do it, we can do it. This is when I was living in the south of England as well. So we were about 70, 80 miles from London. So there was always this thought of, yeah, we could go to London, we could go live in London and pack our jobs in and make it big, you know, which was kind of what people literally did that in those days. I mean, you know, people were willing to do those sort of things to uh, get a music career. Obviously, there was no YouTube or anything like that, or internet, so you want to get showcased, you often like to get down to London, so there we were, making our own songs and I suppose trying to appeal to people, you know, with the old uh, leather trousers and all that garbage <laughs> people were wearing back then. I mean, ludicrous now when I think about it, but yeah, it was only a bit of fun. Yeah, you're all trying to get noticed, like. So in the early 80s, uh, what gear was there? Yeah, again, we were in that period where, if I keep switching around the camera, you can see various planties. We were in that period where... Uh, Gear was still pretty expensive. If you were to go and buy a Fender or a Gibson, it was still not the cheapest, not the cheapest thing to do. So I was playing in this band with a, basically a Fender Strat copy. I mean, it, it wouldn't stay in tune, it was hideous. But it was all I had, all I could afford. Um, the, other, the other guitar player, he was mainly a rhythm player, he, uh, he had a Gibson Les Paul Deluxe. And he had this spare Fender copy and it had the DiMarzio pickups in it. It was a bit better. So for rehearsals, I'd use that. And then for the live gigs, this is, uh, you know, I think back to this, this was quite an amazing uh, opportunity for me, really. <laughs> for the live gigs, he worked in this guitar shop and um, at the weekends. And uh, he was, he'd always say to the guy, uh, the owner of this guitar shop, you know, uh, oh, yeah, me mate, me mate in the band is going to... Uh, He's going to uh, buy one of your guitars. But he just wants to try out this. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry about that. I should have put it in aeroplane mode. What a moron. Um, yeah, we're going into uh, real David Attenborough territory now. Hell, well, we wild wildebeest of North Lancashire lurking in the bush. I'm surrounded by plants and things that look like grapes the seeds off the tracky, tracky carpus palm so yeah he used to, he used to, <laughs> he used to say uh, my mate he's, uh, he's going to buy one of these going to buy one of these guitars like and uh, off you but he just wants to try X, Y and Z and it's been the uh, early 80s and uh, 
a new wave of British heavy metal where everybody was playing basically humbucker guitars, nearly all Gibsons, flat, flat necks, you know, big frets. So every time we did a gig, I, I'd turn up with this guitar with a with this with a different guitar, and people must have thought I was absolutely bloody loaded. Like <laughs> I was like, "What's up with him? He's got another guitar." But of course, I was just borrowing these guitars, no intention of buying one. I couldn't afford one. So, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it was mainly Les Pauls. So we'd be there with these Les Pauls, and you know, different one every time. And I'd got Les G's as well to try out. It wasn't Gibson's finest hour, to be honest. So I look back, <laughs> it was quite, you know, these guitars. I don't want to be disingenuous to Gibson because uh, they've had their ups and downs, but they were making some right planks, I think, in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. So I seem to. It sounds like I'm going to be ungrateful. I got to play a few of them as well. But, uh, they were far better than the Strat copy. You know, than, uh, and the band looked like we actually knew what we were doing too. And we used to pl plug these into these PV50 waters. Oh, I'm just going to a seating area now. Shall I go in the seating area? Um, yes, let's go into the seating area. And you can have a look at a trampoline. So yeah, or you can have a look at me here. Uh, my bonananananananas. We can get them in. It's all been slow going this year with the weather. So yeah, somebody's dumped a cushion on the floor. I like it. Strangely found a lightsaber. <laughs> Yeah, the way we went down with some of those gears, I guess, could probably could have done with this, but uh, there you go. So yeah, there we were. Uh, we were playing through these 50, uh, PV50 waters. Uh, they were the classics, they were like a, a valve uh, transistor hybrid thing, and they're really good. I wish I could have kept that, but I sold that on to get my first Marshall head. But uh, we used to... For the gigs, we used to borrow these 412 cabs and we used to stick them on top of them. They had a pretty good sound, like, you know. So, you know, it, the gear we were using in the early 80s, really quite traditional. Very difficult to, to, to buy anything affordable. Other than sort of like your PV type brands, you know, that, that you, if you wanted to buy Marshalls and Fender amps, they were still extremely expensive. And guitars too so there wasn't a lot of choice but we made do and got on with it and it, they made the sounds that we needed which were kind of like you know i suppose people were just starting to use a lot of preamp gain then in those that period so using a lot of the you know the, the volume was still there but the preamp game was giving you that distortion that a lot of bands you know you think of your iron maidens and priest and all this lot you know. That's a lot of those are the typical bands, Saxons, another one, Motorhead, all those, but people were trying to emulate, so a lot of preamp gain and those things. And uh, yeah, we, we just got on with it, used the gear we had, and yeah, a lot of fun. And uh, you'll be glad to hear that I still haven't got those leather trousers, they're gone, they're long gone. <laughs> so, so the early 80s, yeah, well, the volumes we're playing at. Uh, I'd say we're moderately loud in that band. Because the PAs were still absolutely rubbish garbage in them days. So, yeah. And it was all higher for us. We just didn't have any money. We were teenagers and we were poor paid jobs. And most of it was higher or we were on the bill with another band. So it was like that, you know. So really, you know, we had to have it a certain volume because we never might talk. In fact... Unless it was a really organised big gig, and this this is for the whole of the 80s for me, in a big venue, I was rarely ever mic'd up. Yeah, which sounds crazy today. It was always just what was coming out of the amp, and uh, you had to just get on with it. So you were playing at some crazy levels, really. Crazy volumes. So this band, yeah, we, we got on with it in that band, but eventually the usual things <laughs> happened, so... I mean, I don't want to say too much on here about it because you never know who might be watching. But I'll give I'll 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 give a, a 
an example of the sort of daft things that were happening when you were a teenager in a rock band. The, the, the bass player there, he, he, he ran off with a Danish au pair girl. <laughs> so, um, the other reason that band stopped, I'm not going to divulge it on here, but uh, it was a bit saucy. Nothing to do with me, but uh, yeah, it was a bit saucy. But, uh, the next band I joined, I, uh, I had still had the PV, and then I, went, I moved on to a Marshall 50 Watt JCM 800, which I've still got. I'm going to feature on the channel at some point. What an amp that is. And that into the 4x12 cab. As I said, I traded in the PV for that. And uh, anyone watching this in the local area will remember the legendary Hobbs music. With Bruce Hobbs there. Mr. Mr. Cheery Chappy. Um, but he gave me a hell of a deal on that. I think he might just... He, he was like a top martial dealer in the northwest at the time. He gave me a hell of a good deal on the cab and the, the top. Fantastic, in fact. I ain't near, so I was the happy owner of that rig, and um, my God, that thing! I still got it, like I say. But that threw the dedicated four twelve cab. We got the GT seventy five speakers, I think they're called, in the, in the cab. Wow, what a loud machine that was, and still is. I haven't used it with a four twelve for years, and in fact, I haven't played a a Marshall through a four twelve for a long time. Though. Last time I did that was a guy called Ian Hades, uh, he's a bit of a local legend, singing like he's 50th, and uh, that'll be like 10 years ago. Um, he, there was a rig set up there to uh, to go through, it wasn't my Marshall or the, the cab, the cab was an orange 412, unbelievable, but it's 100 watt Marshall, and, and that's the last chance I've had to play through a rig like that, and I absolutely goosed this thing. It was brilliant. I thought, yeah, even though we've got a PA and it's mic it's the last chance I'm probably going to get to be able to do this. And it, ah, that's turned out to be the case. But back in the 80s, we were, you know, we were turning up in small pubs and, and playing these things. It was absolutely insane. So, you know, I remember we did a gig in a, in a, in a, a Lake District town called Kendall. And uh, we actually had a bit of a PA with us and... Uh, we still crank these amps. Yeah, it was crazy. Even though we might talk, and it was mm, some modest sized venue. But apparently, the, the landlord he thought we were we thought, he thought we were excellent. He, he said he'd offer us back any time. Only his uh, optic. We were that loud. His optics were rattling. They were rattling out of the bloody colders and all the rest of it. Like basically too loud. So yeah, incredible. Fond memories, and uh, yeah, every band, every band was playing a friggin' Marshall. And apologies for the swear there again to my younger viewers, but every band was playing Marshalls back then. It was a it was a crazy time. But uh, Marshall dominated the eight hundred. Oh, I'll say I'll do I'll, I'll do a, I'll do a vlog on the eight hundred. I've still got it in that. But basically, that was the amp that saved Marshall. Really. Um, they were struggling. I mean, it seems daft looking back now because everybody used them. And they were struggling a bit at the uh, turn of the 70s and the 80s. And, uh, the, the 800 rescued that and everybody was using them. After that, you know. that turned into the Silver Jubilee in the late 80s and that was another amp that uh, enhanced the reputation. But uh, For Marshall, you know, the 60s, uh, early 70s and then the 80s, golden period. When I look back, you know, I think everyone's got their own playing style, yeah, and it's what, what the tones in your fingers, but we all sounded pretty well similar in some respects, you know, that's uh, that mid range grindy sound. But uh, you just had to have it, you know. It, a, a Marshall head and a 4B12 was like a badge of honour. I mean, it sounds bloody stupid now, doesn't it? But it was like a badge of honour. You'd have, you'd have the. Uh, You'd have the rig there, and uh, and you'd hope you could get it to the venue, and you had somebody to help you carry in and out the car or the van. But uh, yeah, very very heavy in all senses of the word. Guitars, well, yeah, I was I was on a I I'd got a Gibson Flying V at this point, uh, a mid mid to late seventies, two tone sunburst. The guitar I should never have sold. Still breaks my heart thinking about that thing. Why I got traded that in, I don't know. 
I think most guitar players have got that story, haven't they, in them? So, yeah, traded that in, should never have done it, should have kept that. Last time I looked, they were going between four and five thousand dollars in America, then things, but uh, it's not about the money, it's about the guitar. Well, that was a brilliant guitar, stayed in tune, just everything, my neck was just right, it was just, you know, it was perfect for me. So that's what I was using right through to the late 80s. Um, pedals were interesting. I mean, pedals weren't really a thing when I talk about the first band I was on about in the 1980. Pedals weren't really a thing at all, you know. They're still pretty primitive. But by now, that the Boss had really got a grip of things and MXR were in there. And yeah, I think those were the two most available ones you could you could get hold of really. So I had some boss stuff. I had the um, I had the boss heavy metal pedal, which is also known as the uh, Swedish or yeah, I think it's the Swedish or the Scandinavian chainsaw pedal. <laughs> All the doom metal people collect these things and you know doing that stuff. But yeah, I I used to set that to the level flat out. And just a little bit of gain on it. And you had a parametric EQ, which was really useful. So that was just... I used to get some really good results with it. And then I moved on to uh, what a lot of people recognise as one of the all-time great classic overdrive puzzles. And that's the Boss uh, SD1. Uh, the Super Overdrive, the yellow one. And that, I used that continuously through to uh, the early 2000s. That. That's all I really needed. I had I had a Boss Chorus, which was a great, a great pedal really. The uh, the classic CE2 and the uh, DM3, which is like the DM2 delay. It's all I ever needed. And probably now all I ever need to be honest with you. So yeah, that's what I was using, and that really covered a lot of ground for me. But uh, I've got to be honest, when I look back to those days, the volumes we were using. I, Probably no no respect for the singer at all. <laughs> it just absolutely hacked it. I'm going to give you a different view. I know you probably peed off with that view. Oh, I'm going to go around here now. Yeah, the singers, poor buggers. The monitoring was still poor then. But as I can say, your things. If it was a local pub or club gig, your things were rarely mic'd up. So it was just crazy we were crazy so, um, let's see if we can get around to it a, a gunner well the light's not very good on it there's the gunner that's a beast and a half isn't it so yeah i don't have much respect for things that the respect we should have done but uh, Thankfully, in these days, monitoring is so, so, so much better. And PAs are so much better. We've all turned down a bit and uh, using smaller rigs, which I don't want to talk Oh, that could be a separate video of what's going on nowadays. I suppose the other thing that defined the 80s was the, uh, I suppose you'd call it, I think a friend of mine described it brilliantly when he described it as Guitar Wars. <laughs> so, you often had like twin guitar attacks. So you'd be in a band with some other guitar player, and often it was a mate, it was fine, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd be sensible about it. But if you got into a band with somebody you didn't know that well, or you were getting to know, and that, and they were just losing it on the old ego, they'd just crank it. So you'd crank it, and they'd crank it more, and you'd crank it, it was ridiculous. It got crazy. And then there was the other thing was like, of course, how fast can you flip and play, you know? So, around that sort of mid-80s, you were getting all these guys coming on the scene like Vi, Satriani, Melmstein. So everybody's thinking, oh, we've got to play at that speed. We've got to go completely bonkers and play at that speed. Oh, I'm going to go into the undergrowth now, fellas and ladies. It's lovely, isn't it? <laughs> Lovely to be outside in the warmth. Here we are in the jungles of Malaysia. So yeah. This, that was the thing as well. Speeding up to play. It was just bonkers. You had to play fast. Like, you know. 
I remember this gig, uh, this band, the defunct now. It was crazy the amount of money that was going around, especially in America. This American band played at our local venue at the Gardens, as it was back in the late 80s, early 90s. And they were a really average kind of um, hair metal band. I can't remember, I'll probably, if anyone wants to put in the comments who was there. Um, we went to the after show party as well. It was John and Scouse definitely were at that. Um, is it the something boy? I can't remember. Anyway, they had like a um, Japanese American guitar player, and uh, he was pretty do pretty good and pretty flash and all that. He was just playing at a million miles an hour. But afterwards, we went to a little bit of a party at their hotel. And this guy was splashing the cash. It was unbelievable. He was like on about. 300 quid a week expenses in back in the late 80s. I mean, that's like getting on. Well, late 80s now? What? It's getting on towards a grand now. Amazing. And he's so, you know, he was off his tits on coke and all the rest of it. So we, us being us, <laughs> we just get him to go to the bar and get endless rounds of drinks for free. I think I only went out with about a fiver that night because I just thought I'd get in for now and see this band and go home. But... No, it's six o'clock in the morning, I'm still in this blooming hotel, like, this guy's buying the drinks and all that. But he challenged me to some kind of guitar duel, because once he found out I was a guitar player, I didn't tell him that, somebody else told him that. He wanted to go back for a jam and, you know, and see who's the fastest gun in the bloody water, west or whatever, you know. Utter, utter nonsense, like. Six o'clock in the morning in the northwest of England, um... We're not exactly going to be turning the amps on, fellas, are we? We're not going to exactly be cranking out of the bedroom at that time of day. And uh, he just didn't get it. He just didn't get it. These lovely flowers on the tropical. I see it's beautiful. He just didn't get it. Like, he was like, oh, no, 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 we can't, you can't have a jam at any time, man, and all this kind of stuff, like, you know. Yeah, back home in my flat in the... Uh, Miami Beach. I think he had a flat there or somewhere. It might, it might have been Florida or whatever from. Or it might have been Miami itself. What a thing that is, man. Yeah, this is a this is a non-entity of a band, and they were all holed up in these wonderful blooming flats. And the run, money in the record business then, especially in the rock world, was absolutely crackers like. So there he was, absolutely uh, obsessed with him being the fastest guitar player in the West, like, and I can give it toss really I just want to just want him to go to the bar again and get a few more drinks in for everybody <laughs> yeah he's quite an obnoxious little fellow really but uh, that's the way it goes I love American I love Americans I'm not going to go at those and uh, you American people at all like me. but he was um, typical of the scene back then there's plenty of British guitarists that are just as arrogant and bonkers maybe not with the money but uh, he had but yeah so everybody was just trying to be the fastest, and you know, all the melody and uh, phrasing you put into guitar playing, that just all went out the window. It was absolutely nuts, like, really, you know, that's why I liked guys like Alex Lifeson and Michael Schenker, and uh, if we're talking about 80s guitar players, that were prepared to put melodies into solos and all that kind of thing, Yeah. And if it's sort of more of the bluesier thing, I used to love Robin Trower there. Jimmy Dew, God rest his soul, great vocalist, bass player. You know, just, it was just, they were just crafts people, you know, they're great. So in the 80s, it was just like, let's, let's all do the Eddie Tapping thing, let's do the hammer arms, the guard. But yeah, it wasn't really my thing, to be honest with you. I would say, yeah, always try and go for your, you know, work on your own vibrato, you know what I mean? That's, that, that's what will define you and your own sound. Try and sound like you. you. have influences, but just try and sound like yourself. Yeah. By all means, if you want to copy that Michael Schenker solo or whatever it may be, who's your hero, that's great. And, yeah, look at the gear he's using, and if you want to copy what gear they're using, that's fine. But at the end of the day, use that as an influence and... Just try and move away and be yourself at some point. And I felt in the 80s, maybe, rock towards the end of that decade. It, it, it had uh, burnt the candle at both ends. Brilliant fun. Absolutely brilliant fun. The gigs were brilliant. There were loads of gigs. All sorts of sizes. It was great. I'm not knocking that. It was fantastic. 
but it sort of burnt itself out in the end, you know, and got ridiculous. And uh, of course, that brought us into the uh, the era of grunge, which um, I don't want to upset people about my opinions on grunge. I think there's some brilliant stuff on the grunge bands about, but there was also some pretty dirty stuff in there as well. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It. <laughs> Let's put it this way, my mood isn't um, my mood isn't climatised to grunge, really. I, I kind of much preferred the uh, ridiculous hedonism of the 80s, even though you look at me now, you might not think that. So, yeah, towards the end, I'll just come and come around here and watch my feet on the step. I'll stand in front of a tree fern. It's gorgeous, that. I can get it on. Um, I don't think it's picking it up, so, oh, there it is. So, yeah. So, towards the end of the decade there, uh, you know, Steve Vine, the Satriani, these guys, the, 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 the super strat kind of influence that Eddie Van Halen started, late 70s, early 80s. They were making more sophisticated guitars in that sense. Uh, everybody's using whammy bars and... And again, that became a kind of parody in the end. And uh, even I went down the whammy wad bar route for a little bit. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It was a lot of fun, but yeah, we burnt ourselves out. And I think the music was becoming sort of second to the, the bombasticness of it all, really. Uh, yeah. In the early 90s, it all had to change. Yeah. Whether you think that's for the better or not, I don't know. But maybe that's for another video. But uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, as I say, I was playing playing a, a flying V with a trem on, a color trem by the sort of late eighties. Late eighties. So. Even I'd fallen into that trap, like you know, so. all the sort of pinched harmonics and all the nonsense. So. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, and I enjoyed most of it <laughs> and uh, would I go back and do it all again I'd go back and do it all again because I would yeah I think but it'd be a bit more um let me say less excess and more maybe learning the instrument <laughs> which of course these days yeah I, I, I tend to be more of a student of the instrument than a student of uh, getting drunk all the time and mocking around like and to, again Maybe some more road stories in all the videos. So that's just a brief overview of guitar in the 80s and what we were doing. And uh, I hope you got something out of it and enjoyed it. And, uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for uh, the views and subscriptions. And, uh, you know, I don't really, I'm not one of these people I want to say, oh, yeah, just click the notification bell and subscribe and all that. You know, I'm not one of those people. But I suppose I've just said that anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, part of this channel, I will be looking back like a fart. Um, a lot of that knowledge and a lot of that experience, you know, maybe on YouTube you get some amazing players, but uh, for people of my uh, vintage, you know, I can talk about these things because I'm actually doing it. So, so maybe a bit more of this in the future. So all it remains for me is to say... Goodbye from the jungle. Tati bye.